I think everybody's in. So this is the June 11th meeting of the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Committee. Um, we've got, um, this is all on Zoom. And so for that, we need to um, make sure that we have a quorum um, on Zoom. So we've got um, Angie Gregory sitting on the committee, Pat McCarthy, myself, Ben um, Bile, um, Deb Clemmer, Lou Hasbrook, um, and um, I thought Tim Smith was in, but I don't see him. So I think we're ready with a quorum. So we can um, begin with the first item on the agenda, which is, um, hang on a second, um, let's pull this up. Whoops, wrong one. Public comment period? Yes, public comment. Does anyone have a public comment that's something other than what's on the agenda, the posted agenda? Okay, and I think James Lowenthal, you are first up, so go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. James Lowenthal here, uh, 181 Crescent Street. And um, I, uh, I lead, among other things, Northampton City Lights. Uh, which is a citizen group uh, and dedicated to um, uh, reasonable controls of outdoor lighting to protect the natural environment at night for wildlife and for human health and for the starry sky. And I've been in, uh, in touch with a number of you um, in recent months about the possibility of a, uh, a new subcommittee of, uh, of NESC that would be dedicated to this. And um, thank you for all the thoughtful responses from uh, Deb Clemmer and, and uh, Carolyn Mish and Marissa Elkins and um, Angie Gregory. And um, I appreciate your perspective that this is not the time to form a new subcommittee. I've already stretched very thin. Uh, but um, thank you also for the, uh, the welcome for Northampton City Lights uh, continued input as um, we all as a city try to enact the vision laid out in the city's new outdoor lighting ordinance. Um, which is a, a good and a strong and a progressive ordinance. And um, we are absolutely ready to help with that. We have a lot of uh, expertise, including from uh, other cities and towns and internationally. And we would, uh, we're absolutely ready to help in any way that we can to um, get the word out to uh, parts of city government that may not uh, know or understand or appreciate uh, the regulations as they are now, the new ordinance. Also to uh, private contractors, we're uh, ready to help develop material um, to uh, give out to um, uh, permit applicants at City Hall who are proposing projects of any sort uh, that might include outdoor lighting. Um, and we're ready to, to develop and help distribute and educate. And anything else we can be of help, we're, um, we're happy to do that. So uh, thank you again. And I would, I'll just add one thing, sorry, that that's, um, I know you have a, a pollinator subcommittee that has been dormant and maybe reconstituted. And um, I just wanted to add that um, from that there is obviously some overlap since uh, pollinators are devastated by light pollution as are migrating birds and most mammals and fish and invertebrates and everything. Um, uh, and there may be enough overlap that actually light pollution will be addressed in that subcommittee and uh, we'd be happy to participate in that as well. Um, and also from the perspective of energy savings, I know that one of the largest line items for the city uh, central services is electricity and specifically street lighting. And we're also interested in helping from that perspective. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Um, uh, Susan um, Tiverge, I think you're next. Thanks. Thank you. Um, a couple quick things. First of all, I just wanted to say um, that I personally and, and Climate Action Now and Northampton are the coalition. It is uh, everybody's thrilled about Ben being uh, currently serving as our director. Um, and um, I, it, I know that a lot of you were not there for this because it was like 1130 at night or something. This was the very end of the finance committee meeting was, and it was a very long two days because there was a Wednesday night and the schools and everything. So 
I was amazed that anybody was still there and it was basically the folks that had to be there and us. So I, I wanted to share quickly that um, Ben did such a great job of laying out, you know, a really thought out vision and strategy just coming in like he'd been on the job for two days. Obviously he's been involved for way longer, but he really laid out, um, you know, a map of how he's gonna be doing his work and did a really great job of um, making it very concrete for people about how in that position, you're actually bringing in a lot of money if you're if you're out there finding grants and um, finding ways to save money. He gave some wonderful examples of all of that. Um, I don't wanna take a lot of time right now, so I'm gonna encourage everybody to watch the, it's easy to find because it's like the last part of the meeting, the recording, and it, it will be out soon. It wasn't out at, as, as of yesterday of the finance committee where you can hear Ben give this amazing talk at the end of the night. And really everybody who is there so appreciated that people were really excited about it on, on, on the city council. It, it was like such a positive way to end the evening. So that's the main thing I wanted to say. And I just have another thing I want to share. And I, I um, this is different. And Carolyn, I've already talked to Sarah LaValle, but I've discovered an invasive grass in my garden, my meadow, and I'm really concerned about it for the whole community. So um, if anybody has a weird grass growing in their, in their meadow or their yard, I'd really like to talk to people about it because um, it's invasive in other parts of the country. And um, so I just wanted to just mention that here because we are about sustainability and um, this could be very disruptive. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I don't know if Tom or Helen were next. So Helen's first on my on the left side of my screen. So Helen Seidler, if you could introduce yourself with your address. Yes, hi, thank you. Helen Seidler. I live at 26 Crescent Street in Ward 2. Um, and I just like to um, make a request of the commission. And um, this has to do with communication. And I would say that although the Daily Gazette does a, a really good job of covering climate issues in, in our region and beyond, basically, the Northampton community is living in an information desert when it comes to what the city has been doing on climate and what the opportunities are there um, are out there for engagement. So I'd like to suggest that the NESC develop a vigorous outreach program that um, uh, in support of its goals around energy and sustainability and what city re residents can do and eventually probably must do uh, in order to meet our goals. And it seems to me a communication program of the nature I just described would be a great opportunity to um, be in concert with the, the Climate Action and Project Administration Department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to remind folks, public comment is for any comment, with, um, but the committee doesn't um, engage necessarily respond to the comments. Um, and it could come up as a as um, an item on the next agenda, but I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so that this is a time to take public, um, any public comment of any kind. So um, Tom, that's it. Thank you. I live at 40 Howe Street up in Ward 7, across from Arcanum Field. And I'm also a member of Mothers Out Front uh, Climate Action. Uh, and I'd like to speak about uh, endorsing the application for Northampton to become a climate leader community. Uh, I think it's something that Amherst has already done. And there's an opportunity to gain both consulting help from the state and other um, agencies, state agencies, as well as funding so for energy conservation, energy uh, solutions. So I think it would be a benefit to Northampton to become a climate, energy, climate leader community. And there's only one item that we need to uh, complete. And I believe that's a creating a pol two items. Okay, creating a, Ben's giving me two, two, two. Uh, one is the, uh, 
electric vehicle uh, policy and <laughs> something else that Ben is going to mention. But I, I just want to endorse that and also welcome Ben. And uh, I think we're on a great start now or restart for the uh, Kappa program. And I would also uh, second Helen's uh, recommendation for more outreach. We've got the CCA coming up, and I think that's going to be a community choice aggregation. It's going to be a huge thing to, to explain to people. Uh, so there's some outreach for you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, Adele. Um, ranks. I believe you said that we should hold our comments about energy coaching until the energy coaching uh, item on the agenda. Is that correct? That's correct. Oh, then I will take my hand down. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other public comment. Um, so I think we'll um, move on to the next item. Um, and sorry about this. Um, and but I guess before we do that, I think it was already alluded to in the um, in um, the public comment. But um, we have um, a fully staffed. Climate Ac Action and Project Administration Department now. Um, so I will start with the general updates of that, that um, as was mentioned, Ben is, has now officially started as the director of, um, an interim director of the department. And we also have a new energy officer, um, Gabriella Fox is here. So she just gave a wave. Um, so just wanted to let you all know um, that both of those folks are here now. And so it's exciting to um, have that um, capacity back and expanded. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, the next item on the agenda is really just general updates. And so I don't know if anybody on the um, commission has updates under that category that they wanted to provide. Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, okay. Just so, a quick question, Car Carolyn. Would you yeah. consider um, anything I have to offer to be in the category of department head up reports and therefore I should save it for then? Um, yes. Great, thanks. <laughs> so you're at the end of the agenda then. That's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so next up, um, discussion and votes on the resolution in support of an act relative to the future of clean heat in the Commonwealth and an act establishing a moratorium on new gas system expansion. So just to give you um, a, an update. So this came up at the last, there was a presentation at the last meeting and lots of discussion about, um, you know, some of the details, maybe adding, there was a decision to, um, work on the resolution a bit more and present it back to the committee for sort of final vote so that it could go to city council and um, the city councilors um, would take it from there and provide either, you know, however um, Councillor Elkins and um, Councillor Kummer wanted to proceed with that. Um, I apologize that I didn't get the edits out to you until today. So it was totally last minute and I'd be happy to do a screen share and show the red line from the conversation that we had um, at the last meeting. I also um, think there are even some more tweaks um, from the version I sent you earlier today. So I wanna share okay. that one. Um, the um, uh, mayor read through it and added just a couple of tweaks. So I think if it's okay with the rest of the members, if I go ahead and screen share, and then we can look at the um, additions and modifications. Okay, great. Hang on just a second. Let me pull it up.
Okay. Okay, do you see the um, pink version, red line version, essentially? I can zoom in too. Let's just do, whoop, whoops. I don't know what happened there. Um, sorry. Okay, so um, I, let me just see if I can zoom in if that makes it easier for folks. Okay. Um, so the first paragraph were no proposed changes. Do I need to make it a little bit bigger? Maybe I can get rid of this screen here. Sorry. Um, um, let's go a little bit bigger. So the second paragraph, um, there was conversation about adding references to the um, Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. So added that paragraph, the city of Northampton has adopted a Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan upon which the city is committed to becoming net carbon neutral for city buildings by 2030 and for the entire city by 2050. Um, and then a new paragraph, whereas the mayor of Northampton with the approval of city council has taken significant steps toward meeting these goals by establishing a new climate action and project administration department and allocated climate stabilization funds to transition the city to renewable energy. And then a third new paragraph, the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission is charged with advising and assisting the city in identifying, developing, and implementing and managing programs and policies for achieving energy efficiency and energy resource sustainability and guarding against effects of energy resource de disruption, depletion, and climate change in all of Northampton's public and private sectors. And, and then continuing on with the paragraphs um, previously that were discussed last time. And then moving down, um, second page. Um, Whereas the transition requires a strategic plan to retire the gas distribution system neighborhood by neighborhood, replacing it with non-combusting energy and planning to improve the grid with more powerful wires, reconductoring on existing poles, all of which should be planned to be accomplished through rate basing and equity based structures to support transition for low income residents. And then now for the now, therefore, be it resolved some tweaks to the language to that second paragraph. Um, adding equitable transition and a plan for bolstering electric grid infrastructure. I think this should be elect not electricity, but electric grid infrastructure. So I would propose that. Oops. Um, and then um, just a restructuring of this bullet down here, retiring gas pipes by street segment or neighborhood prioritizing leak prone pipes while moving the connected customers to network geothermal systems, ground source heat pumps, electric air appliances, or air source heat pumps. Um, and then I think that's the last, and then just a, our city instead of town, um, that's the last change. Um, and so I put that out there for discussion. I'd be happy to leave this as screen share, or do you want me to stop sharing so we can go back to speaker mode, whatever you think works best. Um, I think it might help to have it up. Okay. And I will just add one other comment to put out there for the group. Um, the term methane is used throughout, and I'm wondering if that should be replaced with fossil fuel or natural gas, or if people think that methane is more appropriate to have in this context. Um, and so I'd like to make sure that the commission members speak first, and then we can open it up for public comment. No comments? Yeah, I, I have just one comment, which is, Thank you, Carolyn, for doing all this rewriting. I, I mean, it's really good, really good work. Um, I uh, I like that natural gas is in quotes, um, and because it's you know once you've called it methane, I think calling it methane it is mostly methane. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would 
uh, I mean, does it leave open the possibility that they're going to try to add some sort of hydrogen gas amalgam in there to, to you know, the, the theory is add hydrogen and reduce the percentage of methane and the natural gas. It's never going to be economically viable. <laughs> like, it, it, it's just crazy to turn electricity into methane, or sorry, into uh, into to hydrogen and then just combust it. <laughs> so I, I, I would stick with methane. I think that's a great choice. Okay. Any other comments from the committee before I take public comment? Okay. Um, Denise, I think your hand up was for your hand was up first. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for doing the edits, Carolyn, and also to the mayor for her edits. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of give a couple of updates, like legislative updates about where these bills are uh right now. So um basically. Uh, bills have moved to Ways and Means, the ones that are progressing this session, and uh, TUE. And so right now, the two House bills are kind of there as um, uh, trading uh, pieces, um, but the Senate bills that are referenced in uh, the resolution are active and before TUE and Ways and Means. So uh, the chair of TUE, uh, Senator Roy, and the chair of Ways and Means, Senator Barrett, are now going to work with the bills that have made it through, hopefully come up with a um, uh, omnibus bill uh, that will contain a lot of the elements of all the bills. So uh, the Future of Clean Heat bill, which is Senate Bill 2105, uh, is um, really a designed to allow gas companies to serve customers in different ways. Right now, legislatively, they must uh, uh, provide gas to customers who request it. And uh, the DPU has uh, requested that legislation be passed to uh, enable uh, the DPU to regulate the utilities in such a way that they can start moving to be thermal providers instead of gas providers. And so this bill is really critical. These bills are really critical. The bills are now in, um, as I said, in uh, committee and uh, the session will end July 31st. So the timing is critical. And if we can move this up to the city council and get the city council to uh, pass it and then send it up to the legislature, that will be great. Um, I have uh, heard Karen Spilka quoted as saying that she's not hearing from constituents that this is something that they care about. And so we really need to be heard um, and the cities and towns should um, make sure that uh, the legislature knows that we really wanna move up and move forward on this. So thank you so much. Um, thanks, Denise. Uh, Tom? Thanks. Uh, again, Carolyn, nice job uh, putting this together and creating a document that is pretty well all-inclusive. I have two comments. One, in the first paragraph, you're saying that uh, to achieve the net carbon emissions, um, we must stop burning carbon-based combustible, I would recommend, fossil fuels in there. And then you're saying such as, which is a, a limiting factor. So I would propose that fossil fuels be the less limiting terminology uh, in the document. That way you're talking about oil, you're talking about all sorts of coal, you know, if somebody goes back to burning coal, uh, rather than just single this out to being natural gas. Uh, and then the other comment, uh, I'm not sure where it was. Uh, I can't see the whole document, but it was uh, talking about the different types of solutions, uh, heat pumps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, shouldn't that be or rather than and at the very end? In other words, it can be 
all these different um I'm, I'm not sure what the where it was now uh yeah there you are yes uh right there should that be final that where it says electric appliances and air source heat pumps should it be an and or an or there to allow for all of those solutions or any of them great thank you um we can put that on all of those on the floor for discussion um Thanks for your comments. And just, you know, to be clear, um, Denise and Prue, maybe just Denise, um, presented the full text of this resolution. So I don't want to take credit for writing this resolution. Um, we just were, um, I just massaged it based on the conversation from the last meeting. So just want to make sure that the credit goes where it's due um, to Denise and, and um, fo other folks. Um, Susan. Just a real quick thing, um, Tom, good point about fossil fuels. I, we need to keep combustible in there. For example, biomass that is burned for electricity is not a fossil fuel, but it's combustible. That's So if we could keep, great to add fossil fuels, but to include combustible. It includes things like burning garbage. I mean, there's a lot of other things that are toxic and terrible for our climate and our public health. Denise, um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to clarify that this is really a methane bill. So this is about our gas infrastructure. So we don't really need to worry. And there is language in it about uh, hydrogen and actually mostly prohibiting hydrogen, um, except in there are a few cases where it might be useful in hospital or science building settings um, where or industrial settings where you really need intense fuel, but um, but uh, as as we decarbonize. But otherwise, this is really just about uh, giving um, uh, permission <laughs> to the gas utilities to move away from providing gas. So. Thank you. So um, can I can I any... say? Carol, Carolyn, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Thanks. Oh, this is Eric. I'm sorry, I was out and I, I, I can I couch that a different way? I, I think, I think mm -hmm. what we're really trying to, to put forward in this is the desire for electrification. Um, and granted, I know Ben's going to jump in and say, but we need to do um, ground source heat pumps, which isn't necessarily electrification, but the issue is natural gas in distribution systems is messy and leaky, and it would be great instead of using that natural gas for thermal uses in, you know, small residential, commercial is 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 to try and electrify them. I think it's important, and it's important to distinguish that. And I don't think this statement has anything to do with electricity produ production. So I don't, the last comment um, I, it didn't seem consistent with what I thought this, this was about. Maybe you can clarify that for me. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Ben. Uh, Eric, I am not going to jump in and say that it, there's any one technological solution. <laughs> um, I, and I agree with you that at least right now, if we're electrifying efficiently enough, we're better off combusting the natural gas in a combined cycle uh, um, power plant than in a house. Um, exactly. And there'll be more and there'll be more gas available to do that. Right. So th in that the bulk, this in the bulk I, system. I don't think this affects that because this is mostly about the distribution system into end user areas. Um, I actually would like to not be uh, technologically picking picking technological winners in that last paragraph um, because technologies change. If we get uh, deeper uh, geothermal drilling, we might have direct production of high temperature, you know, at least for heating purposes, heat from geothermal. 
right? And, and a utility might find a way to do that in a cost-effective way that they can make a profit. I would, you know, obviously <laughs> they probably will do it if it if it's going to work, but it, there's really no reason to, to specify what should replace the natural gas. It's just that it should be renewable. And it should be, you know, it sh and it shouldn't add uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Um, so I, I would actually be inclined to, to, to just like while moving connected connected customers to renewable, non polluting alternatives. <laughs> you know something. Well, you... Yeah. It's just a, a thought, just to leave it vague because yeah you know who knows what people will discover that that works best sorry say that uh, i just want to grab that for further discussion sure. um just Re put it here renewable comma non-polluting uh, and i guess non-polluting captures or, or uh, low carbon um, no, zero, no carbon or low carbon? Yeah, I guess if we want to specify, I'm almost feeling like non-polluting covers the carbon emissions too, but um, but sure, we could go non-polluting, uh, non-carbon emitting <laughs> uh, alternatives. Yep. Um, I, don't know. I don't know how people feel about that one, but it, it leaves it open. Any other comments what, from the it? committee? Go ahead, Eric. The only thing I would, the only thing I would say on that last thing for, that Ben offered is that there are some zero carbon technologies that are not necessarily considered renewable. Can you give so, us an so example? It should, well, nuclear power. Right, but that's nuclear. You're not going to put a nuclear reactor in your basement. I mean, we thought about that in 1950, but you know, uh, uh, Bill Bill Gates wants you to. Oh, but not in the distribution system. Correct? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Not in your distribution <laughs> system. So it's not in your basement. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, if there aren't any other comments from the committee members on this, um, I'll go back up to Tom. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify uh, that this resolution is meant to support a particular statewide bill. And why not put that bill number into the resolution so that takes care of all the first paragraph uh, in terms of whether it's methane or whether it's this or whether it's that, it's saying the we support the whatever bill number, I can't remember what it was, Denise, um, does that help to clarify what we're supporting? I think it's up here. Um... I thought it was in here. Where is it? Oh yeah. So now there, it's in this paragraph. Okay, so it's at the end. All right. Uh, well, under the resolution part, at the top. Okay. Great. Yep. Thanks. Yep. That clarifies it for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, Adele, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say. In addition to to uh, supporting Tom's comment um, that the wording of this document really doesn't matter. You are telling the legislature that um, that you're supporting this bill. And um, and so the specific wording, whether or not it's clean energy or whatever, um, is really not important. It's the most important thing is that you're supporting this bill. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. Hi, Carolyn. Hey. Yeah, Marissa, hey. go yeah. Ahead. I, I, at, at the risk of, I, I want to, I just wanted to 
sort of reiterate what Adele said, um, and also just in terms of carrying the ball, I, it's, it is most important that we identify the bill um, that we're talking about, um, and as much as we can mirror the language. I think it's important to in include our sort of local prerogatives uh, in the whereas is in the, in the uh, you know, why we're putting it forward. Um, but um, the most important thing is to, to clearly identify the bill. I, I, I also, I apologize, I'm driving, so I'm not looking at this, but um, I, it sounds like it's the Senate bill that is going forward, but we, we should include any variations on it that are in the, in the form of House bills or just every iteration of it that is supportive, we, we should include. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Marissa. You know, just, just to be respectful of the legislators who are carrying the ball in both Senate and House. So that's all. So if there aren't any other comments um, on on this from the committee members, I think the course of action would be to a vote to um, recommend uh, or to have um, send this to city council. And I guess um, I think from the last meeting, both Councillor Elkins and Clemmer said that they'd be happy to sponsor this. And I hope I'm not speaking for you, but please speak up and confirm this. Um, so if that's the case, then the committee would, should vote on passing this forward as an item to um, for the city council to, to be introduced to city council as a council resolution. Uh -huh. yeah, and then it would be handed off basically to the councilors to, to introduce it. Okay. I'd move to... Oh, wait, hold. On. Okay, thanks. Um, Councillor Clemmer, sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that I'd be happy to co sponsor it with uh, Councillor Elkins if you would okay. agree, Councillor Elkins. Yes, I agree. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. So then um, we need a motion and a second to. Um, um, recommend that this be submitted as a council resolution. Yeah, I recommend it be submitted as a council resolution. Okay, second. is there a second? second. Okay, Marissa, great. Second. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and do a roll call. So Pat, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, ben. Yes. Um, Deb. Yes. Clemmer. Lou Hasbrook. Yes. Angie Gregory. Yes. Thank you. Um, Marissa Elkins. Yes. Eric Inkler. Are you still there, Eric? Yes. Okay, great. So yep. that, that passes unanimously. So I will, um, forward the clean version to Councillor Elkins and Clemmer to do their magic into the format for city council. So thank you. Um, okay. So next um, on the agenda is the energy coaching and update, update and discussion. So Ben, is that you? It's not really. This is, I okay. think we, we are going to hear from Eric Broadbent, who kind of was going to bring us whatever the latest stuff. Is that all right? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, all right. So, Eric, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric Broadbent. Um, I live uh, on Old Wilson Road in Ward 4. And um, I <laughs> I'm representing a group of us that are interested in um, in the Northampton uh, Climate Emergency Coalition um, who are interested in establishing, if we can help, a coaching program here in Northampton. So I thought I would touch on a few points. And I, I apologize that I, I believe this came up last 
meeting and I I missed that meeting uh, inadvertently, so I apologize. So I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity today um, I, to spend just a few minutes. I, I would like to just say, touch on some a few points. The first of which is why are we talking about coaching? Why is it necessary? This is energy coaching. What it is and what is a coaching program how it's different from what Mass Save offers. Um, and I also am glad to see that people were interested in, I believe from the last discussion, what, how it would address um, the equity challenge um, in terms of housing and low income. Um, so I'd like to touch on that. And then just briefly, um, there's talk about the examples of other programs and I believe somebody else uh, maybe Adele is going to talk about that uh, more in depth. So why are we talking about coaching? Um, well, you know, it goes back to the 2008 the Global Warming Solutions Act said we're, we have this goal to reduce our carbon footprint as a state, um, at greenhouse gas emissions. And since then, the state has embarked on a series of clean energy programs. <laughs> um, and this has coincided with the emergence of new clean energy um, te heating technologies, as well as incentives. Um, and these are fairly complex. Um, many municipal organizations, governments, and many organizations are trying to respond to this demand. But the, the, the degree of complexity requires the homeowner or resident a lot of it requires extra time and attention to learn about and navigate this myriad of programs, incentives, and technologies. And it's beyond the capacity of most, most people to just understand and make decisions in a process which uh, makes sense for them. Um, often they're forced into it um, when their water heater breaks or some some other catastrophe and they end up perpetuating the use of fossil fuel based um, equipment. Um, so that's a lost opportunity right there. Um, the other thing that can happen is people do install some of these um, technologies and then they don't get the, the result is not what they were hoping for. Um, it could be a design issue or maybe um, there wasn't enough weatherization to make a difference. Um, so energy coaches can help households and, and, and residents and households understand the equipment options, the incentives, and help set them in motion on a path that meets their needs and their, their finances. Uh, when, you know, at a, in a controlled way so they can move forward rather than having to make that decision all at once. And a coach typically would be somebody who is in the community, who is impartial, has no financial stake, and is there to guide them through the process. Um, so that's what a coach is and and that's why a coach is necessary um the 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 changes that people would classically go through or the the measures would be first weatherization after an energy audit um and then perhaps um some recommendations to um electrify or move off of fossil fuel based systems um since each of these changes is costly and and uh and the incentives are not, they're somewhat opaque. Uh, um, a coach can really be there to answer questions over time. Um, um, so right there, there's a distinction between what this kind of program or, or person might do than mass say, but I'll touch more on that later. Um, some coach, there are coaching programs in Massachusetts, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the, the menu is usually weatherization, space heating and cooling, water heating. And then sometimes um, pro, uh, coaches can have enough expertise to advise on EVs and, 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 and batteries and, and other things. But generally, it's, it's about heating and cooling. Um, so uh, what we would, what we believe 
uh, can happen here is something that has happened successfully in other in about 20 other communities uh, or more, two dozen or so, is a coaching program. And what that typically includes is some sort some sort of public interface, a web site or page where where people can get information, um, links to important uh, programs and, and um, information. But that also allows for uh, the public to request assistance, to request a coach. Um, uh, and that a lot of uh, municipal programs have that kind of interface and there are some non-municipal programs as well. Um, so there needs to be this public interface, somebody who monitors it, and routes requests um, or a group of people. And often that is a program coordinator position. Um, it includes coach training and development. And there's there are three organizations that provide that. I'll mention their names, Abode Energy Management, um, the Heat Smart Alliance, and Rewiring America. And several of us uh, have um, gone through that training um, so the other necessary elements are things like tracking the coaching engagements and outcomes. I mentioned the coordinator who would perhaps do triage and route requests to uh, available coaches or appropriate coaches. And then sort of an assessment process that needs data. How did this work out? Do we need to change our process or anything? And that, that usually means that there's regular meetings between the coaches and coordinator. Um, to identify issues, learn more, share, and hopefully reach out to other coaching programs to gather expertise. And that's one of the strengths of the Heat Smart Alliance, which I mentioned, which of which I am a member. Just briefly on that, Heat Smart was a Massachusetts Clean Energy Center program, and I was involved in the pilot phase as a coach in the town of Harvard and worked with the coaches in Concord, Carlisle. Concord and Carlisle, and they started the Heat Smart Alliance. As a result of our in-group consultations, they thought it was a good idea. And it's grown, and there are now um, over 20 Heat Smart Alliance programs, uh, coaching programs, sometimes associated with the municipality. Um, other noteworthy aspects of a successful program include, you know, alliances with the Heat Smart uh, program or Mass Energize, another um, another uh, organization, uh, and and as as I mentioned, a means of outreach and interaction with the communities, maybe a newsletter, um, and sometimes a presence at environmental or community events like that. So an interface that lets people know um, that this service is available and puts a face to the. Um, there's a wonderful photo of a of an energy coach in Amherst who had who had took off on the Snoopy paradigm and said, had a booth, the energy coach is in, and she was uh, at a climate fair and just many, many people, okay, there was a line, there was a line of people asking help. Um, so what, why is this different than MassSafe? Um, well, MassSafe services have his, were historically limited to energy audits first and then uh, and providing funding for weatherization some loans or rebates for heating and cooling equipment. And then MassSafe had a website um, where you could get, get request these things and get more information. But until recently, MassSafe didn't offer any specific one-to-one -one consultations. Um, and they now have a, a, a free service, which used to be a pay for, where a homeowner can get a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an energy expert. And there's a place to go sign up for that. And this is great, but it's only a point in time. And people make decisions and move forward and then need more advice on, on the process. So a coach, in, in contrast, is there until the person is either satisfied or, um, or doesn't interact with the coach anymore or doesn't find it necessary. Um, all right. So I have two more points. I'm sorry to go on. Uh, for longer than maybe I should. But so the the equity challenge, how would a coaching program meet this? Um, the the challenges of building decarbonization in low-income communities are, are greater 
um, there may be language barriers or multifamily buildings that may not be as well maintained as uh, as other homes. Um, and often people have limited access to funds themselves or, or understand pathways to, to finance. Um, so it's best if there is an in-community representative, a, a, a person who is living amongst those people who can sign up to get trained uh, as a coach and maybe even has a stipend. And there are two programs that one of which called uh, is called Electrify Northampton, East Hampton. And I hear from a person on the energy committee in East Hampton that uh, Chris Mason was, was involved on that. And then um, they asked, well, have you talked to Josh Singer <laughs> about that? Because he knows something about it. And we all, um, that person no longer uh, is, is working on it. So I don't know where that program is, but it, it, it is an example of the kind of targeted funding that could be used to do this. I don't, as an energy trained energy coach myself, I don't have any uh, credibility or, tr or wherewithal to go, to go into an EJ community and say, Hey, I'm here to help. Um, we really need to have some, <laughs> some way of training people from within the community and, um, and maybe even pr provide a stipend ideally. And so the electrified Northampton East, pr East Hampton program is out for RFP. It includes funding. And then there's the community first partnership, which mass save, um, it's a, it's a mass save program and there's some money available there, but I don't know, uh, the, where, I don't know where, where, I don't have any particular um, proposal around that. It's just a, another way to maybe access some funding for coach training and stipends. Finally, um, there are, we have two lists of coaching programs or electrification programs in Massachusetts and coaching programs, uh, maybe there are two dozen and they vary between either all volunteer or volunteer plus municipal or fully municipally run and, and uh, with paid coaches and, and, and so on. And there is data available that shows that these programs accelerate heat pump and other electrification installs by a factor of two. Uh, and that was proved, that's data that was collected by the heat smart lines. Um, so I, I, I know that there are some very successful programs in Arlington and Newton um, and um, that we can look to. Um, uh, but, and I, I hope that somebody who knows more about those, one of those will speak, I think Adele. Um, but um, in general, I w this group that I will uh, that I've been working with has is working on a proposal that includes this rationale and some specific points. Um, I'd like to either work with Ben or others uh, or somehow be able to work through some of the details and see what we can do. We have a scoping, a phased approach, so maybe the first step is to just establish a website that would be hosted by the municipality with links and information. And then once once there are enough trained coaches uh, or we feel like we can start, then maybe start receiving coaching requests and, and so on. So um, I think I'll stop there. Sorry to take so long. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't know if there are any comments from the committee members or um, Adele, if you were part of that presentation and you wanted to make a per quick presentation, we have a number of other items on the agenda that we need to get through before 5.30. I actually have to leave at like 5.20, so um, um, go ahead. Very quickly, uh, Local Energy Advocates uh, was interested in learning more about energy coaching programs and so invited Leora Silks to a meeting last summer. Uh, she coordinates the program in Newton. And um, the Newton program started out as an entirely volunteer program, um, but it was so valuable and so popular that uh, the city decided to hire her 
to um, oversee the program. And um, her presentation is available on our website and I'm happy to provide the link to anybody who, who would like it. Um, and she has generously offered to share her materials that they have developed uh, at some expense uh, with other municipalities. So we would, would not have to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so I'm just going to raise hand. I'm going to be super yeah. fast about this because I know we have to move on. But Eric, so that was helpful because I, I really was not clear about what was available, what wasn't. Um, so I'm looking at the uh, community partnership, the, the, the as with all of this stuff, I, I just want to know where, where the money is going to come from. <laughs> and um, so it, it seems like the, the community first partnership is probably our best bet. Um, and so it's a fairly complex application. It's a December 3rd deadline. Um, and what I can say is that the CAPA office doesn't have the resources now to just have that pro program coordinator. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, so, you know, we could look at Gabriella's uh, responsibilities and see if, if she could do part of that, but I suspect this will go beyond or would start to go beyond what she's capable of doing, maybe at the startup component. Um, actually responsive to, uh, I think it was Helen's comment at the very beginning of the meeting among uh, Gabi's uh, projects is to improve our website and to develop better communications systems. So that is in the works, um, but this, you know, she's what, this is the beginning of your third week, not even quite a third week. Uh, so, um, you know, give us, give us a minute. Um, but uh, if you look at the uh, community first partnership, it is going to require not nonprofit organizations. So that could be local energy advocates or, the, you know, the, some of the groups that are represented by people here. Um, and there is nothing to stop us from working together or from having the city um, help to host some of the things as, as you described. So like basically everything you described can be done and probably the way to fund it is through the community first partnerships at least at first, um, and that would mean coordinating, not necessarily within this committee, but we could actually get together and try to coordinate and see what roles are going to be played by whom, and then apply for that, um, unless you can come up with, oh, and then the last thing is an update is I'm on the group that's uh, selecting um, people, uh, a contractor for the East Hampton, Northampton uh, electrification. Um, that has a very narrow uh, target. It's it's targeting low and middle income uh, people, possible emphasis on on renters, and only has a target of a hundred heat pump installs. Um, and so it's it, it and it's fairly limited how, how they're going to use the incentive and all that. But the concept is the outreach techniques and and resources that are created should be. Uh, of longer duration and maybe that contractor can find a way to be funded to to continue through that's all i have thanks any other committee members okay go ahead eric you're mm -hmm. muted um thank you ben it's helpful to uh, understand uh, where you are and where things are with those programs. Um, and thank you, Gabrielle, for <laughs> your work on the website. Um, I look forward to that and um, appreciate it. Um, a group of us met with uh, the mayor um, a little while ago, and I described some of this um, and asked if the funds that were set aside for climate mitigation work, the climate stabilization fund might be a source. Um, and 
I'll just say she well, had a positive response. Um, the I don't know if people have seen, I think Carolyn has a proposal for services from abode that was sent to us as a sample of what services they offer. They will assist municipalities in this and their fees were not large enough to cause concern. I mean, they are, you know, in, in the tens of $8,000 for this and something for to help establish a coaching program just to put things in context. So I do not know where funding would come from, but there are possibilities. So let's see what we can do. Thank you. Okay, if there are um, no more comments on this, um, I think this was just sort of an update and discussion, so no particular action item. Um, the, um, so we can, um, continue to sort of explore that and get more information as we, um, move along. Um, the next item was about landscaping and there's been discussion about the, um, you know, pollinator subcommittee or a landscape subcommittee. Unfortunately, I think the two folks that would be instrumental to this conversation are not here today, so I don't know if it makes sense. Maybe we should put this on, you know, move it. And I know we're getting into summer, so that may be difficult depending on who is able to attend the next meetings, but I think it would make sense for both Tim Smith and Rich Parcelletti to be um, part of the conversation. So <clears throat> if if it makes sense for the rest of you guys to, if we can put that on another agenda, I think um, we, that would be more fruitful if um, if we do that. Okay. Everybody, sh do I see shaking heads? Yes, yay, okay. <laughs> um, great. Um, let's see. Okay, so counselor updates and then we can get to department head updates. So counselor updates. Anything from Councillor Elkins or Clemmer? Um, I haven't heard anything about the paint stewardship, um, but I think they already went to the Ways and Means Committee. So I'm gonna to try to find out and get some, get an update on how that went. Thanks. Councillor Elkins. Um, I don't, I don't have anything to to add at this point. We're just trying to get through budget season. Yeah, uh, never ending. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. So that leaves us with department head updates. Ben, you're up first. Oh, I, actually, I managed to get my update mm -hmm. in. I slid it in there. And then, Carolyn, you did one of them. One of them is Gabriella. It, the, she is the update. And, you know, so I <laughs> wanted to introduce her. Um, but you did that. And um, and then I was going to say that she's working on a website. And, um, well, okay, so we covered that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that those were my two ma main ones. Um I, I guess I'll just just kind of say there are a number of municipal building projects kind of in the works, and I'm trying to figure out how to fund each of them. Um, and it's kind of a moving target as we discover new things. So uh, that's not much of an update. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, well, and I'll I'll just say that I felt like I should do that introduction at the very first part of the meeting um, so that both, because you officially hadn't started at the last meeting. So I felt like, okay, maybe we should make sure everybody who's on this call knows. So, but I didn't intend to steal your thunder. So, um, <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think that, um, I have any updates. I mean, you know, that related to the building systems, we've been, um, you all know about the geothermal feasibility study that relates to the affordable housing project that's being designed behind City Hall with a municipal vulnerability preparedness grant from the state. 
and we were able to get an extension on that grant um, completion so that now they can take, uh, Valley Community Development can take that information that came out of the feasibility study for at Forbes to design um, a geothermal um, exchange and, and system for that new building. So they are very excited to be able to go full force um, ahead with that. And that means if they do that, that means, you know, some boreholes probably in the back of city hall as part of their construction at that, in that parking lot. Um, and um, I think that's basically it. So that's all for me. So I don't know if Pat or Louie, you have any updates? Go ahead, Louie. Yeah, I mean, when we're the building departments dealing with um, the new energy code and the energy code is the new code is is been approved, which which is basically the new building code that integrates the energy code. Um, and it's become a, a fairly significant part of any any sort of significant project. And it's actually becoming a significant part of some pretty small projects. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that that's going to have a big effect. One of the things that the energy code is going to have a big effect on is a renovation of a, uh, a I guess you'd call it a townhouse. Only it's like an 1840s row house, one unit um, in Florence, and they're going to have to get a hers rating done um, on the renovation, and it's. Um, Still not clear how it's going to. How you can take a an 1840s um, row house and bring it up to um, current code hers ratings. So those are the sorts of things that we're dealing with. Um, and uh, um, I could keep complaining, but you know, basically it's just a, it's a huge learning curve. So and uh, a lot more discussions with. Um, architects and first readers than we ever had in the past. So at least we're all learning. That's mine. Sorry, Pat, Pat anything Pat? for you? Am I last? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really have least. much to add, except that I'm thankful that both Ben and Gabriella are fully, you know, CAP is fully staffed and we're already working together and have meetings set up and trying to figure out a saw. <laughs> so we're moving forward and happy about it. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, the last thing on the agenda are minutes that I also slipped in at the last minute. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anybody had a chance to read it. If you don't feel comfortable looking, um, having not looked over them, we can certainly punt them to the next meeting. Um, but let me know how you feel about that. Okay, I don't see any motion, so I, we can put that on the next agenda if you'd like. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll do minutes then next time and um, and we'll leave it at that. And that's the last item. Does anybody else have anything before signing off? Great. Thank you all. Appreciate it. And have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Bye -bye. Have a good weekend.